Servus and welcome to another episode of the Pro Hockey Pod, episode 18 this week. Yeah, uh, what what can I say this week? Very special guest, uh, someone that I owe a lot to in my in my life, especially my hockey career. Um, when I moved from Peterborough to Burlington, uh, this is one of the few people that believed that I could play at the highest level to begin with, gave me a chance, and I was able to run with it ever since then. And if that didn't happen, I probably wouldn't have had the the career I had in terms of college and European pro, but uh, yeah, he was also a coach of mine, long playing career, currently still coaching now. This guy has seen it all, been through a lot of situations, a lot of rise to a lot of occasions, persevered through a lot of things. And, you know, he's also uh, the father of my, one of my close friends. Welcome to the podcast, Mark Juris. Thanks, Harzy. Pleasure to be here. So starting off, we always take it back to your kind of your childhood there. Uh, you were raised in, in Burlington, Ontario. Is that where you first, uh, you know, kind of learned to play hockey and fell in love with the game? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my dad was uh, actually a soccer player. Um, didn't know a lot about hockey, but had the the backyard rinks. And I spent many of hours on the backyard. And uh, yeah, just whenever I could, I was out there playing road hockey or on the backyard rinks. That's one thing I wanted to bring up was obviously your dad is, is, is from Belgium. So like, you know, big there would obviously be as they call it in Europe football, or as we call it in North America, soccer. So was he ever trying to kind of push you that route as well? Being like, Hey, you can do kind of hockey in the winter, maybe football, soccer in, in the summer. Or was it, he always just saw right away that, you know, the North American sport, at least in Canada was more towards hockey. Um, he never really pushed either way. Um, I, I did actually play soccer, um, but I just fell in love with the game of hockey. And um, yeah, I, I couldn't get enough of it. I was more like some days, you know, you talk now, kids are multi-sport, but like I was soccer winter, or sorry, I was hockey winter and summer. Like I was, I remember him dropping me off at the rink at Barton Street Arena during the summertime. Um, dropped me off on his way to work at eight, picked me up at three. That is one thing that's definitely different in Europe, uh, in various parts, at least I know in Germany, like there's no, it's really hard to find ice in the summer here where in Canada, there's always accessibility, you know, the rinks are in 12 months of the year. So that obviously helps, uh, you know, the young players, especially can go on the ice at any time, hone their skills. Someone like yourself would have done that. How was the, the minor hockey path back then? Like, obviously we grew up Josh and I, and then you as our coach, like we had Burlington Eagles. So it was triple A, double A, single A. Was it similarly structured back when you were playing? Yeah, we never had, I think it was just, it was called uh, Tri-County and triple A. Um, we only had the two groups. Um, I was, yeah, I played triple A growing up. I played house league to start. Then I joined, uh, I, I think I may have played one year double A hockey. And then, uh, played triple A in Burlington growing up. And um, that was the goal back then was to play the team. I'm now coaching the Burlington Cougars. I remember dad taking me there on Friday nights and just admiring those guys. It was just, I wanted one of those jackets so bad. Well, you evidently got one of them. Uh, speaking of the Cougars um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, this is elite prospects. So they're not always hundred percent accurate, but it says you only played one year for them. And uh to say the least, you uh you torched the that season, 127 points in, in 40 games. Um, how was that jump for you? Because obviously you were, you know, younger back then, maybe 16, 17 years old, making the jump to junior. Well, it I it, it was it was correct. I only played the one year. Um, I had made it the year before, but my dad thought I was too young to play, so he wanted me to play another year of minor hockey. Um and I mean, I think it was the right thing. I obviously developed a little bit more, got some more confidence, um, came in. And yeah, we had a really good team. I had really good line mates, played with a guy who scored 50, Marty Prouse, and another guy, Peter Flood. And we really had some good chemistry and um, had a great year. And then on to the next step, RPI. Before we get to RPI, you brought up a pretty good point there. You know, your dad, you know, someone you obviously looked up to, trusted with advice comes to you and says, Hey, I know you made the team in Burlington, but I think it'd be better if you stayed back a year and you brought up kind of for your development, how you thought it was probably 
better you were able to play another year of whatever it was midget back then play in those bigger minutes do you think that really like had a big impact in you like coming into the the junior league the next year and having such a productive season I think no question I mean everybody wants to play and I understand junior hockey is is a little bit different than than the minor hockey and um that's more where the business starts coming in right you, it's it's there you're there to win um he just didn't see me being one of the go-to guys so he thought it was going to be better and um I listened to pops and yeah the rest is history I mean evidently his advice was uh was pretty good and then as you said you obviously achieved a d1 scholarship to to rpi which is a, a really good school uh before you committed there were you talking to any other schools going on any other visits i did i i actually i had a lot of i had a number of schools that were interested um but i remember meeting with mike adessa and paul allen they came to my house and they brought me sticks with my name on them and i was sold right then <laughs> That's all it took. And then, uh, so obviously you end up going to RPI there. Um, very productive, uh, four years there played with some pretty, uh, pretty known names. I would say some notable guys that you ended up playing with Adam Oates, obviously who went on to have a very long professional career, Darren Poopa, the goalie and a good buddy of ours, Randy Cowardice. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask you first, how was the experience? So you, you go into college basically as a true freshman. So you're going at 18 years old. Like, did you feel, you know, after that dominant year of, of playing for the Cougars that you were like ready for being a student athlete? Um, That's a good question. I don't really, um, I didn't really think about it much. I was just, again, I was going there um, to play hockey, um, to get an education. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. I know I was nervous. Um, but yeah, they, they they have such a, they did a really good job with their, like going in with Randy was there and Marty Dahlman and Mike Sadapur. Um, and they really made you feel welcome and comfortable. Um, and I think that's why we were such a successful team and we ended up winning a national championship was just that camaraderie and family. Like they really took you under their wing, all of them. And, uh, yeah, it made it really easy. You brought up too, like, so they made it easier for you to to go there and adjust. And obviously things were a lot different then than they are now. You know, now we have FaceTime, Skype, texting, all that stuff, ways to communicate mm -hmm. with our friends and family. Like, how was it, especially for you at, at first there, like, you know, being able to maybe talk to your parents and family, like a couple of times on the phone or like sending mail, like, how was that adjustment? Yeah, there was, there was no email. We actually sent letters. Um, but yeah, and we'd talk once in a while. Um, again, there was a cost, right? And I would make a collect call and um, but yeah, no, I was I was pretty good. I was pretty independent. I think the toughest thing was learning how to do my laundry. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's growing up, right? It's all part of it. And uh yeah, it was it was a great experience. Well, and you said too, you guys were obviously able to win national championship there. Like just take us take us take me through that experience someone who obviously uh you know hasn't been there i've gone to a couple of finals but obviously couldn't get the last win done like did you guys just kind of have that feeling in the dressing room amongst the guys where you know everything was clicking the, the the bond was there you guys were a family and just knew it'd be a special season we knew my my sophomore year i mean there was arguments that that sophomore team was probably a better team than we had the, my junior year with Randy and Dahlman. Um, and we came up short in that one. Um, but then my junior year with, uh, yeah, we were just primed. We just, um, we just had that feeling, that belief that every game we didn't go in hoping to win, we expected to win. Um, I, I remember really vividly, we were playing against Vermont and we were down five, nothing, I believe after the first period. And we all thought the coach is coming in and just going to ream us. And he just kind of came in and said, okay, boys, enough. Let's play like we can play. And it was really odd. And we went out and Adam was put on a clinic and we ended up winning eight, five. 
just speaking of Adam, just quickly, you brought it up, like playing with him back then in college, like, did you know this guy's going to have a, a very long NHL career? Well, he, you, you didn't know to the extent, you know, he was special. Um, he was, I compared him. He was a, a small version of Mario Lemieux. He would just, he could just the way he could fend off um, probably from his lacrosse, Andrew, um, his ability to just like draw people in, he'd have two, three guys on him and he'd still be able to make fine thread passes. And um, yeah, he was, he was just really, his vision was incredible. Well, and he was another guy like you brought up, not the, not the biggest guy. And back then, especially, you know, they were looking for a lot of guys with more size because of how physical it was once you got to the, the higher levels. And that was the, the belief, uh, whether it was right or wrong, different style of hockey, but back to you, your last two seasons there. So your junior year and senior year, you put it back to back 60 point seasons. So obviously very successful for yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and after college, you decide to go to Finland. So the top Finnish league right away, what was the decision there? Like, did you not want to give the well, North American I was, pro? I, I had talked to a couple of NHL teams um, and I actually started, I went to team Canada, the Canadian national program first. Um, and I had signed a deal with Pittsburgh right after, sorry, it was, and then, uh, it got to it like there was a point in the contract that they had to sign me to an NHL deal or I can't remember exactly what happened, but then they, um, and I had a really great rookie camp. I remember Randy Cunningworth going in and, you know, kind of vouching for me like, Hey, we got to keep this kid. And it just didn't work out for whatever reason. Um, then I moved to the Canadian national program, played half the year there. And then I went uh, on to Finland which was a phenomenal experience itself. So many things to talk about there. Um, first, I yeah. guess I'll talk about the Canadian national program. So for, for those of us who are not familiar with that, like it was a little different back then. Like you guys were playing, you know, 50, 60 games in a, in a year. So how was that structured? Were you guys just doing tournaments? Were you just traveling all over playing? Like how was it set up? Yeah. So it was set up. You were, you, we were actually based, um, out of Calgary. Um, and, and yeah, and guys came through the system. Um, we were in Calgary. Um, and yeah, we went on basically on tours and we, uh, we played in back then the big tournament was the Izvestia cup in Russia. Um, that was a big one. And then we just traveled all around, um, playing against those Russian national teams. We played a couple NHL games. We toured against played NHL teams um yeah but it was based like it was a the canadian national program out of out of calgary father father david bauer arena and were you guys like getting getting paid because obviously guys would be this would be their full-time yeah, job it, right? it was a grant because it was basically you got paid a grant okay yeah oh it's very interesting to because obviously stuff like that doesn't really exist anymore in terms of yeah, yeah, which I I, I kind of think it, I thought it was great for the program. I think the the U.S. national team does that now, right? They're based out of I don't, I'm not sure where, but they have more of a program where you try to make that team, and it's a team, and you grow with them, and um, yeah, and 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 develop that way. Well, and I think it also would be a good uh, way for guys maybe who are in between contracts, you know, whether they want to go back to Europe, they're waiting out on something, they can stay in shape play and also show those teams especially now with all the video and stuff and the accessibility like hey i i can still play oh, no question no question i mean we had eric lindros came through as a 15 year old um we played against uh yeah there was like and we had actually some some pro guys who had just played some nhl hockey and just like you said between contracts trying to get another contract rejuvenate their game um yeah guys were keep coming through and how was your experience in, in Finland? So your first, first, uh, you know, trip over to Europe, I'd say as a professional. It was amazing. Yeah, it was great. I mean, again, I was pretty, um, I was independent and I was, uh, I, I really enjoyed languages, which, which finished is tough, but I picked it up pretty quickly. Um, the hockey was, um, it was the best I'd ever played. It was so fast and so skilled. Um, I, I, I learned a ton playing in Finland for sure and what made you so after that second year I mean you had 
63 points in 42 games. As you said, it's very fast league, uh, very well known. And you end up playing also some games that year, both in Springfield and Nova Scotia in the AHL. Mm -hmm. I, well, I came back and that's kind of what happens over in Europe back then. You don't see it as much now. Um, When you were out of the playoffs playing in Europe, teams could sign you to come back. They didn't have all the deadlines. They came into place after while I was actually playing. I it, it, I got burned one year, um, making the wrong decision. But yeah, so I came back, um, signed with the uh, with the Oilers, and had had a really good um, American League run there. Um, but it was I'm not sure I should have gone to the Oilers. They were a pretty stacked team back then. <laughs> but again, great experience. Had so had a lot of fun playing in the American League and just a different thing, right? Another experience. And one, like one thing for me, like there might be a reason, but obviously the next year you transition to Switzerland, you go to Sierra and then also back to team, team Canada. But as you said, you, you came back from that season in Finland. Uh, you, you start putting up points, especially in Nova Scotia, you had eight points in two games in the season and then five and five in the playoffs. Like, was there not any interest, you know, I don't know how it worked back then in terms of like maybe two-way deals where you sign an AHL deal through a two-way deal with an NHL team. Was there nothing of that sort with you having the success? Well, there was, I'd actually signed. Um, uh, it was a, a, a pro, whatever they call it, tryout, con, whatever it was. Um, and there was talk. I mean, I had talked to, uh, I think it was Barry Fraser was the head scout after, I think I had a hat trick in the one game and he said, Edmonton loved your game stay by the phone um i think you're gonna get called up so i was by my hotel room phone the whole day and i kept getting calls from my parents from my my wife who wasn't my wife then but she is now um and i never got the call and i read in the newspaper the next day they called up mark lamb who was actually out with an injury i was like hey man you got the wrong mark (laughs) and he ended up staying and having a career in the nhl Sometimes it's all about luck and yeah, then. it's just, it, it's, it's, it is what it is. And how was, uh, this was your, one of your first, uh, of a couple stops in, in Switzerland. So Sierra, they were in the, the second league, like how did the second league back then vary from the first league? Because there's a lot of teams in the second league that, you know, either have been in the first league before or could easily play in them. Like there's teams every year trying to get promoted. Well, I was, I went there on, uh, one of their imports. They were, um, he was struggling and he played had a long career in the NHL, not your typical type of import is Mel Bridgman, who was known as a tough guy in Philadelphia. So they brought me in to, to replace him. And I ended up, I was playing with a, a legend over there in Kelly Galoa and we just clicked and we, uh, yeah, we had a phenomenal run there, and it ended up staying in the B League. And um, yeah, but the hockey, the hockey itself, it, it, obviously a different level from Finland. Um, but it's it's it was improving, and and they had like I said, they had guys like Kelly Global playing there, and some real high end imports. And then after that stop in Switzerland, this is where it gets real interesting. You head over to Germany, um, where I am now, and you have a long career there playing in frankfurt berlin dusseldorf i mean some of these years like you were putting up 123 points in 50 games 98 and 44 did you just feel that not to say you didn't have the same production in other leagues but you know things were just clicking on another level in germany and you really enjoyed you know on the ice and also off the ice in terms of the country I did. It was, um, yeah, I just felt really comfortable and it comes with maturity as well, right? You're learning the game and, um, you just start figuring things out. And, um, when I signed in Frankfurt, I was about to, to sign with Toronto that year and it just didn't make sense, believe it or not, financially, um, for the amount of games I was playing over there, I, I was making, more money than I would have made playing in Toronto. I mean, I would have given my left arm to play, but it, it just didn't make sense to go make, I would have been making, I think it was $23,000 in the American league. And that's probably where I would have ended up. So I decided to go overseas and um, signed in Frankfurt and yeah, it just took off. I played again, lucky the guys you're playing with. I played with 
uh, another legend in, in Yuri Lala, who was a Czechoslovakian star. Um, and we finished one, two in the scoring and, um, yeah, it's all about confidence opportunity. And, and again, people you're playing with, right. It's a, uh, it's a team game and, um, you can't do it on your own out there. And I was, I, we had, I had great line mates like Yuri Lala was a, like they compared him. And if you look at the one year he was playing against Gretzky and he outscored Gretzky in the world championships. That's crazy to, to think and hear about, obviously back then, you know, with TV and everything, everyone just knew the NHL and that's it. They wouldn't be hearing as much as maybe today you would with the resources about these guys in Europe and mm -hmm. the, the television rights, I guess you'd say for all these world championships and stuff. But I've heard many rumors. You can either confirm it or not. You don't have to give me numbers, but I've heard the money back then in, in, in Germany that was just being thrown around was on a ridiculous level compared to what it is today. Like just, the, and that's why you would see also these teams be all in for one year, go bankrupt for a year, come back yeah. two years later with another sponsor. There was a lot of jumping around. You can, you confirm or deny that? No, they, the, they definitely were throwing some pretty good money around. Um, I, I was very fortunate. I was the, um, I'm not for sure if you're familiar with that Bosman ruling from soccer. So he was the first, he, he challenged the soccer that he could basically work at McDonald's. Why can't he work with a European passport as in he, why did he have to be an import? Mm -hmm. um, and he won his ruling. And I was the first North American hockey player to play in Germany with a European passport as a non-import. And I had just basically had a, like a, a really good season. And, and so I was basically a non-import with who just finished second in the league in scoring. So there was a bit of a bidding. Um, yeah. I made some pretty good dollars over there. That obviously that rule isn't uh, at least in Germany, it's not, in effect anymore in terms of the European passport. Now it's just the, either you're German or you're everything Correct. else. Um, yeah. Yeah. One thing I wondered, so what, what happened uh, in, in Frankfurt? Cause obviously the, the second year there, you put up 98 points in 44 games. And then the next year you end up going to Berlin, who at the time was in the, was in the second league. Yeah. Um, I don't really remember how that happened. I think there was uh I was going to sign with somebody else and it fell through. And then this just came through with, uh, with the ice Baron, with the Berlin team. I, I, I be honest with you, Andrew, I don't, I don't remember exactly what happened there. I'd have, I'd have to ask Joanne. She can remember. No, I was just, it, there's, it was just curiosity to be honest. Cause you know, you see, like I talked about before and I've talked to other people about this on this podcast is, you know, one year they'll be in a, a higher league, light it up, and the next year they end up somewhere else. And it's always curious why. Like, is it is it money? Is it just no, met someone it, from it there? Financial. Is it something else? It wasn't financial. I think I, I can't remember exactly what happened. Anyways, after that, you uh, you went back up to the the top league there in in Dusseldorf, and then eventually went to the Ice Bear in Berlin. And I can just say I remember first time meeting you and Josh and getting a tour of Josh's bedroom and there was an ice bear in Jersey there as well as as we'll get to later a Vader Mark Scorpions Jersey and I remember seeing those two jerseys <laughs> and just thinking how cool those were like you don't hear about those names in in North America like they're all this standard stuff and you know the the scorpions and and all yeah, that it was, it was pretty cool um so when we we actually when we won with the ice baron in the division two, we brought them back up to the DEL, which would, well, it would have been the Bundesliga back then, which is now DEL. So we brought them back up to the top league. Um, and that's when I got that ruling and Dusseldorf was, uh, yeah, they were a very, you know, wealthy team and we ended up winning a championship there. Um, had uh, had had a bit of a conflict with the coach there. It was pretty documented in Europe. Um, kind of funny stories, but um, it was I, I I'll tell you one with his name was Hans Sach, and he was like a a real dictator type of coach. Um, and I was going through 
I had some issues with some injury issues. I, I, I came down with it, that writer syndrome where I couldn't, I basically was struggling to, I was taking injections to play. Um, so I couldn't practice it. He couldn't figure it out. And I was playing really well. Like I was leading the team in scoring. We were 13 and one, I believe top score on the team, leading the team in plus minus, but he couldn't stand the fact that I wasn't able to practice. Right. And I didn't want to take injections to practice. So he sent me to this um, health spa there to figure out. Anyway, long story short, um, he didn't want to deal with it. And he used to, he went crazy that I would drink Coca-Cola. And, but all the other guys would drink Fanta and they'd mix their Fanta and orange. Mm -hmm. And that was okay. There you go. <laughs> Fanta and orange. So one day we were on, we were going on a road trip. Ironically, it's to back to Ice Bear in Berlin to play. So I'm sitting, I, we were at a big team meal. He wasn't there yet. And I took his seat where he always sits at the table because he always sat at the head of the table. And I had a big Hafey Weizen glass full of Coca-Cola. He came in, stood there, turned around and left. The next day in the newspaper, it was either Juris goes or I go. And I, I responded that, I don't know about him, but I have a contract. So it was kind of funny story. And I ended up back with the ice bear in Berlin. Bill Kessel uh, was not the first to do this. We, you've heard it here first that you were the, <laughs> but the difference was uh, you're shredded and Phil definitely isn't, but uh, <laughs> no, they uh, it's crazy. Like the, you know, the Germans it's called, I believe oh, it's yeah. called like meat Mitzel mix or whatever. They mix half cola, half uh, Fanta now. And that's become a, phenomenon over in this oh country. yeah but it was funny because i wasn't allowed to drink coke because it wasn't good for you but i they could drink orange and fan whatever it was mm -hmm. so anyhow oh. then that brought me back to the ice baron and the funny thing i forgot to end was was really an emotional time when i left ice baron because they couldn't afford it um i had got so into the community there and i was really it was just such a good feel they actually were were would have been like a GoFundMe nowadays to try and keep me in Berlin. And I ended up back there. So it was kind of a good fitting. Well, things call, come for a cir full circle. And obviously, you know, it was meant to be. And you ended up playing, uh, you know, two and a half more more seasons there. Yeah. Then you go off to briefly in Rappersville. But then you go to somewhere where I've played, except they were in the Dell 2 when I played there, which was... SC Research C Garmish. Mm -hmm. Now, for anyone who's never been there, it's basically in the mountains, big tourist town, lots of slopes. How did you enjoy living there? I was only there for two months. You were there for a full season. And back then it was probably even more beautiful. It was, yeah, it was spectacular. It was like it's God's country. Like everywhere you look, it's just it's a postcard. Um, I used to ride, I was close to the rink, right in the mountains. We had a beautiful chalet. We looked over, uh, we looked out from our bedroom window over at a, at a ski hill where they held the world championships downhills. So yeah, it was spectacular there. And I, uh, I used to, I mean, I'd ride my bike to the rink and yeah, it was beautiful. One, one question I have about Garmisch, just based on our different experiences there, like when you were playing there, like, were they filling the rink every night? Um, we had it was hit and miss. There were some teams that would come in and we'd be, we'd have really good fan support. And then other others, it was, uh, it was lighter. Mm -hmm. It was just always like when I was there, like we were playing in the finals at one point and it wasn't even sold out because of just the time. And that's the problem with some of those tourist areas is, you know, from mm -hmm. December until mid March, they're packed. And then after that, it's just the locals. And yeah, obviously it's not the first sports and, uh, in uh, in germany then after uh that year you go off to one of the teams i mentioned before the vader mark scorpions which probably have top five best logos in german sports um and again another not to say garmish wasn't accessible season a lot of points there but again in vader mark 79 points in 49 games um i've always wondered like how was it back then in terms of you know 
getting deals for next seasons? Like, you know, were you using an agent or was it all done by yourself? You know, obviously, as you said, you know, technology was kind of different back then. You might've been always on the phone. Like, how were you like you or your agent at the time, like selling yourself to clubs? Um, I basically did it myself, Heresy. Um, yeah, they would, they would find reach out, um, contact somehow, um, whether it's at a rink or whatever. And, um, and yeah, I did basically my own contracts after my first one, I was with ISM to start international sports management with Dan McCann. They got me my first deal over there. And then I basically started doing it on my own, but, um, yeah, the Scorpions, that was, uh, that was a crazy fun experience. Like the band was, um, th their wives would come into our dressing room after a win and serve the team trays of beer. It was crazy. It was something I'd never seen before. A real, um, real yeah, German it was, experience. It was different though. It wasn't, it wasn't as like the team itself. Like they were just, um, like we didn't have laundry facilities. I remember we had Pierre Turgeon come in one time. No, it wasn't Pierre. Sorry, uh, Sylvain Turgeon played with us, and he was walking around with his laundry bag. And he's like, "Guys, where do we throw the laundry?" I gave him one of these. I go, "Sly, like this over your shoulder, take it home." He was like, "What?" Yeah, because we had to. Do, we took our own laundry home to do our laundry. Even back then, we they just didn't have the facility there. But it was a uh, unreal experience um they were so passionate about hockey small little place there um packed every night um the one end of the rink was open um so in the winter day it was freezing cold on those the uh, winter some winter nights to get out there it was it was chilly if it was windy you get some snow blowing in um but yeah great great experience in Vedemark. That's one of the cool things, especially about Germany is, I mean, there still is in the Dell too. There's three rinks that are, you know, open. And uh, I don't think there are any anymore now that Augsburg is fully closed. I don't think there's any mm -hmm. in the DL, but um, cool, cool things about European hockey. It's not your traditional, oh, yeah. traditional rinks. You also played with a lot of, you know, guys on the, on that roster that, you know, I've known or, or heard of, you know, you got Joe West, Mark West. Mark Mahone, who was, uh, you know, worked in the DL a long time as a coach and GM, and now he's a, an agent. Uh, Pat Curcio, who was a coach and now is also in the agency business. And then obviously Larry Mitchell from also from Burlington, who yeah, long time in Germany now is a sports manager in uh, in uh, this, uh, top Swiss league now in Cloton. So yeah, there's pretty uh pretty filled roster there and it's pretty cool to see that a lot of those guys uh, you know including yourself are still you know involved in in hockey in some way yeah we had like it was a really like close team we had a lot of friends like i said a lot of burlington guys like larry and we had emilio iovio there who who was from burlington who was a guy i idolized playing for the cougars um he was ahead of me and i used to go watch him play and i thought he was phenomenal he was a really good player Mark West, who was an exceptional player, um, Joe West, Lenny Socio. We had a pretty good team. Maybe we had a little too much fun. Maybe that's why we didn't win, but um, it, w it was a really good time. And it looks like the next like the next year, a lot of you went to, to Oberhausen. Yes, we did. Um, yeah, that was a little bit of a, yeah, let's call it a step back for me. It was a little bit... Um, they had a, a guy in there. They brought a lot of NHL guys in. Um, and I had, I had just, I think won the scoring title that year. And um, this coach was just really adamant about playing his NHL guys. Like he had guys like Chris Contos and um, yeah, I just felt I wasn't being used to my potential. I mean, I'd, I'd been lighting the league up for, for some time. And then all of a sudden I had to take a back seat and um so I just asked to be moved and I think I ended up going to Geneva. Well, first it says here you went to Lausanne. Sorry, Lausanne. Correct. Uh, Lausanne. Lausanne. Um, yep. No, you're right. I, that's where that's where Josh started playing. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you first. So how was it back then? Like, was it you would go to the team and they would have to help you kind of find someone for you, or was it just you would be reaching out to teams and if you found the right fitter, then the teams would talk and find someone? Because I always found it weird that 
I mean, not weird isn't the right word, but Switzerland obviously is also a good league. But you, as you said, you had been doing really well in Germany. And I find it kind of odd that other teams in, in Germany weren't, you know, calling uh, Oberhausen and being like, yeah, if, if Mark's available, like we would take him because you could obviously produce in that league. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it was. Um, but again, I think it would have been a little bit different in, in today's world with, with the cell phones. But yeah, I'd been reaching out. I, I had reached out then to the Swiss league. I can't remember. I spoke with someone. They said, you should try Switzerland. Um, so yeah, I, I looked into it. And then I remember I got a call from the coach. Uh, I forget his name now. Um, oh, it's slipping my mind here. It'll come to me. Ben, Ben Wallaport, mm -hmm. who was in Lausanne. Um, and yeah, I wanted to give it a shot and, then I ended up in Lausanne and had uh, had some really good success there. And I actually, I, I, I went in and it was, yeah, it clicked. And I was working with some good players and um, yeah, it took off. And then the next year, as you said, you went to Geneva. So just like your son started <laughs> in, uh, well, I wouldn't say started. You were a little bit in Switzerland before, but, you know, went to Lausanne and then went to the rival Geneva. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that wasn't uh didn't go over well with the the Lausanne fans. Yeah. And they're pretty passionate. They're pretty passionate. Yeah. A little nervous going back there. But um yeah, Geneva. I ended up uh playing in Geneva. I got a call from I'll never forget, remember the GM there and um I mean I forget his name. Uh yeah, and I just ended up signing a year there and um yeah, it was great. Geneva is a beautiful place, and um, you've got everything there. You got the beauty of Switzerland and the and the city, like like New York City. Yeah, Geneva is obviously a city, and then Lausanne. You're li again living on the in the mountains with the the lake in there. Like I went and visited Josh. It's like out of a postcard as well. Mm -hmm. But getting back, so when you made this switch to to switzerland here you know back then and this is a rule that um carried along for a while and they actually just stopped in switzerland but your your son josh obviously benefited from it was him being able to be signed up in the minor hockey system would get him a swiss license that he could use which he now uses in in, in switzerland when he's playing and he's obviously not an import was that something that you were thinking about back then when you were taking josh to all these countries like hey there might be a chance you know, if Germany might be able to chance passport, if it's slow, if it's Swiss, hey, might be able to get him a license. I uh, I'm not gonna lie, it wasn't on our mind, but we had heard. Um, it wasn't like okay, I got to get to Switzerland so Josh gets his Swiss license. It was more after the fact that we, when we were there, that we we knew this. So we like, um, but it wasn't like okay, I got to get to Switzerland at this time for him to start playing there. It it was more a little bit luck. But it was really good luck um, for Josh. I mean, obviously, that's a pretty significant piece to hold. Um, but they did change it. I think it was a year or second year after that. Um, because a lot of players were starting to do that, just trying to come even for a month and sign their kid up um, to get that Swiss license. German passport, Swiss license. I mean, those things are or gold mines if you have any chance at them but um how was it back then like i mean i'm sure down the road i'll i'll speak to him about this but how was it for him you know tr like what age were they traveling with you like every year from the beginning and you know going to new new cities new countries every year like how was the experience for him and obviously you know your, your wife joanne and also alexa when she was born yeah, they were with us. They were with me all the time. Um, I'd basically get over there, set up the housing situation. Um, and then Joanne would pack back then her 13 bags, her two dogs and her and her son. And over she came. She was, uh, yeah, you can't do it without the support of your wife. There's no question if you, if it's, uh, if it's a, if it's a downer for her, it's not going to work. But she was great. And um, it was a great experience. Like with the, the, just the scheduling too, it's you get more of a family life. Um, you know, you're playing weekends games. It's not like you're on road trips for weeks at a time. So it was great. 
Um, and I, I brought Josh basically to the rink anytime I went to practice and he was running around and in the dressing room and got some great pictures of, of him. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. It was a great experience. Well, I'm sure for him, it was just, you know, at such a young age, getting that experience, you know, being in the locker room, watching practice, like he just had those images installed in his head at a young age of this is pro hockey. This is what you need to do every day, how guys are, how they train, et cetera. And then, you know, as you said, like for people going, even if it's in North America, like to have a successful long career, you need to have a partner that's has the same goals as you do and wants to come along and enjoy the experience. Cause it's something that I'm sure to this day, you still talk about with Joanna is, Hey, remember when we lived here? Like, you know, now that oh. it's 20, 30 years later. Absolutely. We were just talking about it yesterday. It's funny you say that. Yeah. We just go back and we, we look at uh, pictures or whatever it is, or we see that and it just reminds you of, of Garmish or whatever. You see some mountains and yeah, you just, you know, you relive it. It's uh it, it was an unbelievable family experience. Um, and Josh, like you say, he was fortunate enough to be around the rink. He was always carrying around his little hockey stick. And then when he got old enough, he'd skate around with us. And um, yeah, I think that's where he really found that, that passion for it. Um, just being around it all the time. Right. And it was always fun. And um, yeah, that's part of it. If it's not fun going to the rink, it's, it's a tough job. Right. But I never for one minute felt like I had a job. Well, I'm sure too, for him, it was also when he's going to these games and, you know, the crazy European atmospheres, the the soccer football atmospheres, if you will. So it would probably would have caught his eye immediately and would have been a lot of fun for a little kid seeing that, watching dad score and the whole place go insane and throwing mm-hmm. stuff everywhere and <laughs> the drums. and Oh, God, yeah. And he it was funny because he was so, um, so focused on it too. I remember Joanne was telling me he'd have a bottle in his hand and he would just be so glued into watching the game, the whole game. Like they'd stay and he'd be just glued watching, following the puck around. And um, he was just dialed in. And that's why he's uh, had the career he's had. But back to you. So after uh, after Geneva there, another quick stop in Rappi. And then your last season over in Europe, you were in Beal there. I mean, you obviously could still still play in these in these leagues at high levels and you were having success but like what made you uh retire from the game professionally i would say um i did we just felt as a family um we wanted to get josh and 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 alexa back home we wanted to get josh into hockey in canada um so we played over there a couple years so we just thought it was time that we wanted to get him started there and get established there and get into the canadian schooling system um yeah so we just decided as a family we thought it was time and who would you say you modeled your your game after like I I mentioned already like we joke you grew up 10 years too early like you were in that era where they were still looking for everyone how to be a certain size unless Mm -hmm. you were Wayne Gretzky like you know if you had played 10 years later when the small guys were getting more chances and their skill was be was allowed to be shown like, mm-hmm. who did you try to model your game after you would say? Oh my God. It's funny. Um, I, I don't know if I had an NHL guy that I looked up to and said that I, I mean, I love Mike bossy. I like Brian Trotche and, um, that might be too old for you. Eh? Um, mm-hmm. but I never really had one guy that I modeled after. Um, I was always a guy that I, I love puck possession. I wanted, I wanted the puck. I wanted to make plays. I loved being a passer. That was kind of my, I loved to pass the puck and school a few guys and then set up an open netter. It's, that was as good as a goal for me. Um, I mean, I think now when I, if I was looking at the NHL and I hear this all the time, like, again, that you talk about growing up in the wrong time. I mean, I, I, I play a lot, probably like a Mitch Marner, um, one of those kind of guys, pretty, you know, skilled, hang on to the puck, make plays and, um yeah something along those lines you definitely uh were a playmaker i would say um for those listening one of the first times i met josh and his family we went and watched his dad who at the time mark was playing senior a for the dundas room mccores where he also played a long time and put up tremendous points 112 points in 28 games one year but anyways the point of the story is 
the one time the first time I go watch them play in this arena and there's a decent amount of people there and Mark is very famous for the toe drag uh mm-hmm. here kitty 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 and I'll never forget you toe drag the goalie and the goalie is completely out of the net and you could easily just tap the puck in and you take it behind the net toe drag it the whole way around to pass to somebody standing in front of the net and he scores <laughs> and I'll never I'll never forget that because I'm just like you could have put it in you could have scored but you just had that mentality of nope let's do a little more and let's get the assist oh I love I love dishing the pocket yeah, I love getting guys open net goals it was pretty cool better than scoring he would have been uh, every line mate's best friend because they know they're going to get the puck. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and then after, so we, we briefly talked about it. You were, you obviously played senior A there, stayed involved in that. And then, you know, multiple jobs on the, on the side, you know, you were in the restaurant business and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But back to kind of your, your playing career. So for you back then, like what was, for the listeners, you know, what were big differences between living in North America and maybe living, living in Europe? Wow. I had some, yeah, it was, I mean, there was a couple different things. I mean, finding t- there was times where they'd close during the day, which like it was tough, right? They had their Ruatag or Ruatstunde or whatever. Mm-hmm. So between 12 and two, everything's closed, um, which was a real different thing for us. Um, I remember when I, when I went to Berlin, that was a big change. I was the first North American import um, in Eastern Europe. So it, that was a huge train. I mean, there was uh, shopping, like the grocery stores. There was times if you didn't get there at a certain time early in the week, they'd be out of groceries, right? Because it was just, it was still, the, the wall had just come down. Um, so that was that was challenging. It was different. I, and I loved it. It was just, again, it's just another experience. As long as you embrace these things, it's it, it's fine if you, if you complain about it or you know what I mean, then it gets it becomes a drag. But yeah, we lived on a fifth floor in Berlin, fifth floor, no elevators, two dogs. So my legs were probably the biggest they've ever been when I lived in Berlin. Just walking the stairs every day. Well, I just think but about I the know was, sorry. I was just saying I think about the differences too. Like, you know, today it's like if you move to a new city, new country. If you don't know something, you just go on your phone, Google it. Where is this? Where is that? And you were there was that was none of that back then. It was figure it out oh, on your no. own and figure it out. Yeah. Cell phones were just being introduced. We had this, they had this one just a massive, like like a VCR almost freaking or those little big mm-hmm. video recorders. It was a phone. Um, but yeah, no, it was uh it was different. Um again, but like if you as long as you embrace it and it, it's fine it was good the people were so friendly and so welcoming and um yeah it was it was a real good experience i ended up doing a uh, like a a commercial there in berlin for a drink and um yeah i go to the go to the movie theaters and see my my the boys were giving it to me on the we went to this movie in in berlin and there i am up on screen it was pretty funny that's hilarious but yeah like what you said is you know it's still the same now like you know, everything's closing from 12 to two because all the workers are going to lunch, having their bottle of wine, couple of beers. Oh, yeah. Sundays, nothing is open. Like if, as soon as you can adjust to that, it's obviously pretty easy. But at first, you know, just thinking of North America where it's work, 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 30 minute lunch break at your desk, like over here, that's oh, why yeah. there's, that's why they're so happy over here because it's just, you know, you don't work it's to survive it's laid back. It's, it's yeah. much more relaxed and laid back for sure. Better mentality, I think. Better for the long run as well. Yeah, better for your health. That's for sure. A little, I think there's a lot less stress and anxiety. And what was it? So back then, what were the differences that you noticed between the hockey playing styles, like from your experiences in, in you know, North American pro and college versus European? Um, time and space. I think the big rinks, um, I, 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 I think everyone says it was less physical. I don't think it was what you'd call it less physical. It's just you weren't able to make those big hits because if you missed, you looked foolish. Um, but yeah, the I, I mean physicality for sure. The smaller ranks, there were bigger guys. Um, that was probably the biggest difference. Where's the favorite place if you could pick one that you played? Oh, geez. Um. Well. 
I mean, from, from, from scenery and picturesque, definitely Garmish. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I have a, a real soft spot in my heart for Ice Baron, the, the Berlin, um, you know, bring it when we won that championship there to go back up and just the, the fans really took a liking to me. It was, um, that was probably my, I would call my home away from home. Finland was probably, um, that was right up there. Just again, the people, that was my first pro experience. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was living. It was different there. Boy, it was, it was cold. I remember driving and taking a bus trip, reading, seeing a digital sign, which was odd. You didn't usually see digital, um, minus 60. It was like, really? <laughs> you'd get out and you're like, your nose would stick together and the, you, the, the squeaky snow. It was, yeah, it was chilly. It was way up in Northern Finland. Oh, global yeah, warming back then. Definitely, Garmis, I mean, like, you know, it was definitely the most picturesque. And did you yourself or you and you and Joanne and like the family do a lot of traveling when you're over here? Because obviously it's very accessible. We, we, we tried. Yeah. We got around for sure. Visited some places. Um, I was never a nap guy. She always, we'd always go visit a castle or whatever game days and go for a little walk and check stuff out. Did you have somewhere that you didn't play in Europe? That might've been like the favorite place that you traveled, whether it was on a break or off day or something. Um, I got around to a few teams, but no, not really. Um, no, no, not really. I was, I would say, uh, there's nothing that I, uh, would say, God, I have, wouldn't want to play there. And then after, uh, you know, obviously when we started to get to know each other there in Burlington, I remember the one season there, you end up going over to back to Sierra where you first, uh, started playing in Swiss there, but you, as a coach and mm -hmm. Coincidentally, you started as an assistant and very quickly was promoted to to head coach. How was that experience for you? You know, you you'd just been coaching basically, you know, us at, at Burlington, so minor hockey, and then you get that great opportunity to go over to to Swiss Pro League. Um, phenomenal experience. Again, I loved Sierra. It was uh that's another gorgeous place. Um, but I probably I probably wasn't ready to take the head coaching job. Um, looking back, I, I, you know, I, I probably wasn't, uh, it probably hurt my coaching path. Um, but you know, you're excited. You think you can do it. And, um, yeah, I think knowing what I know now, I wish I hadn't have taken the head coaching job. Um, but yeah, phenomenal experience. Again, you, you learn from it and, um, you get better from it for sure. On Elite Prospects, it says it was the 07, 08 season, but I felt like it was the 06, 07, because it wasn't our draft year that you went. Uh, oh, here, so you got me. Um, I'm just trying to think, because like... 07, I coached you, I came back and then coached 09. I don't know, I think you might be right. It might have been 06, I'm just, I, I usually have a good memory for this, but I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure that our draft year so our ohl draft year you went over um and we we had uh uh whatever that coach's name was uh, i can't remember his name murray clark murray clark that's why i was gonna say larry clark sorry sorry to murray um and then the next year i think you came back so i was playing junior and josh was playing midget so and you guys had that phenomenal team and i'm pretty sure were you head coach that year when you guys were winning basically every tournament was that when you were back yeah at Cougars? yeah okay, yeah so that was the tier we with Greg Carey and that was Oh nine. Okay. Yeah. So any, Oh, that, Oh yeah. That's what you mean. You mean that year, but, uh, did you coach, did you coach Josh at midget or no? Uh, no, that's the year. I think I left. Okay. So then it is right. Okay. I think that's the year I left. doesn't matter, but anyways, a great experience as you, as you said, and after that you, were the so this was my second year junior i remember this because you were at some of the games but uh and josh's first year junior with me you were an amateur scout for the st louis blues like how did that opportunity come about because obviously those are those are hard jobs to get um and that's wrong on elite it was the vancouver canucks okay um yeah so what happened was um a good friend of mine who i played with dave morrison 
who's still with the Toronto Maple Leafs, um, he had mentioned that they were possibly looking for a scout and he had some connections there. Um, and I interviewed it and, um, yeah, that was a phenomenal experience. I really enjoyed scouting. It was good. Did that for a couple of years. And then I was actually going to re-sign with them, but because I was coaching junior A, they had said that it's a conflict and you had to choose. So I, I just love coaching so much. So I gave up the scouting. Um, but yeah, I wish I was still doing, it. I loved it. What was your, what was your job then? So you were an amateur scout. So were you traveling all around Ontario watching, watching games? Yes. Yeah. I was basically Ontario. Um, I had a uh, funny story. I had one basically assignment. They wanted to see this player, this one player who was playing college in Michigan. So I was the only guy that had seen him. Um, and we were at the draft day. Um, and Ron DeLorme, who was my boss, he was their head scout. He basically got on the phone and Vancouver was coming up to draft. And uh, he put the GM on the phone. He goes, the GM wants to talk to you. Um, so he asked me and basically asked me about, it was Kevin Connaughton. And I'd been the only guy who'd seen him. They obviously, I don't, they probably watch video or whatever. So when I, when they passed the phone back to Ron, the first thing he said to me, he said, your nuts are on the line. And then next thing I hear Vancouver Canucks select Kevin Connaughton. I'm like, Oh dear. <laughs> it was pretty funny, but uh, yeah, he ended up making the team. He played for them. And so that was good, but a funny story. Well, it must've been kind of cool experience. Like knowing that, you know, the GM is talking to you and basically it's, he's listening to you like, Hey, yeah, no, I was for you. sure. I was kind of shocked actually, but yeah, it was, uh, it was good when I heard him. My kind of heart just kind of sank. I'm like, Oh Jesus. So I this guy makes it. And then yeah, after he had, he had a pretty good career. Yeah, he did. I, he was with the, the Islanders too. Was he not? A, yeah. I think Arizona, he ended up with Arizona, Arizona, right. Can on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I was thinking of another guy, but, and then after that, obviously you went, uh, as you said, you had a passion for, for coaching. So you've been obviously ever since then coaching in the, the OJHL there. So the junior yeah. league and in our area on, on a couple different teams, but mostly, mostly Burlington. And yeah. I'm very curious when you're teaching these kids, like obviously you, you have seen both sides of it. You have gone the college route. You have been a scout for Vancouver where you're probably been watching guys in the major junior route. Um, like what sort of a, yeah. advice are you giving these kids or, or just trying to guide them along along the way to get to their the next level that they want to get to? I mean, I also scouted for Barry for a year as well. Um, so I, I, I did. I saw both sides. And listen, the OHL is a great route, um, but it's a riskier route. And if you're not a guy, I mean, a lot of these kids get caught up in the glitz and glamour of the OHL, right? I get it. It's still there their kind of goal and, and, Oh, I play in the OHL. And it's a great, it's a great title to have, but there's a difference between being there and having a jacket and a hat than playing. Right. So that's a big thing for me is, is playing and developing. Um, and the college route for me is, is when these teams are interested in you and ready to take you at college, they're invested in you, right? You, you've got pretty much four years to develop your game to get to the NHL, whereas the OHL, it's more of like, if you're not doing it there, it's, it's, it's pretty cutthroat. The next guy's there to take your spot and um, you don't have a lot of leeway there. So they're both great leagues. Um, but for me, like I said, having the the college background and having gone that route, um, we obviously try to get more kids that are going college route. We will take some OHL guys um, that have played or um, we're going to lose a 16 year old this year to the O. And he's another guy that he would be a scholarship guy, but you know, he's getting caught up in the the glitz and glamour of the O and he's going to give it a shot. I just hope he keeps his eligibility, but yeah, it, it's more of, if you're not a first, a top two round guy where they see you as either a top six or a top two pair of D um, I think the college route is a safer route. No, and that's where I think it's just basically what we grew up with, right? Like I grew up in mm -hmm. Peter, I was going to Pete's games every Thursday. So for Absolutely. me, the the dream was OHL. I didn't know Absolutely. college until I met you. And mm -hmm. I think these kids still see the same thing because they see the high the high guys taken who play two Absolutely. years and go right to the NHL where it's not always 
it's not always that. And I, and I think the college route has obviously taken off re and I wouldn't say recently, but over the past 10, 15 years, I'd say it's grabbed more traction in terms oh, of really interest. And even now I would, I could also argue that CIS U sports has as well. Like it has come a long way to where you're seeing a lot of these U sports guys also going on and playing pro after. But as you said, it's that caught upness of, I want to play in the OHL because so and so did it, and he's in the NHL now. It's 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 that era of I want it all now, right? I want to be in that the show now, right? I want to be the in the limelight where they don't they got to look a little bit big picture. And to your point about CIS, it is it is it is exploding. I mean, there's, I mean, with the cost of, I mean, because they're not given a ton of full rides now in the states now. So if you get a three for four, well, let's say you're you're you know, you're still paying whatever 50, 60,000 US dollars to go, go to school and play hockey, you know? So there's a lot of people that unfortunately are able to do that if you're not getting a full ride. And, um, and then the OHL guys that are going CIS and yeah, the league is, is so much better. I mean, when we played, when I played at RPI, we used to play top teams from CIS and, and, and they had no chance. Like we beat them 10, one and, um now these the these middle pack team cis are beating good ncaa programs it, it's 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 really really catching up no it's it's come a long way i think one of the things the ohl did recently over the the past few years there was they started as soon as you play one game you get a year of school package so that oh yeah they're giving basically scholarships now to the cis for sure and they're allowing guys to, you know, if you've played, you know, four or five years in the OHL and you want to go play one year of pro, you don't give up your school package. So I think that's Correct. good. It allows yeah, them absolutely. to to try. And then, you know, they still have that school package there, which is, which is good. But back to you. So you as a coach, like, you know, as I said, you've been working in this league for, for many years now. You have many guys coming through your system and, and moving on. What are your, like, coaching or developing philosophies you'd say like what are some things you you stress really hard that if if someone's listening right now and maybe in a year or something they're going to play for mark juris this is he knows in advance this is what i need to to bring well the mark jurises of the past can't play today because back then it was you were an offensive player or you were a defensive player um you need to be able to play a 200 foot game College guys, um, OHL guys, they, they're all looking for complete players now. Um, so we really try to stress that. Um, it's great. Obviously, you've got some guys that are, are that produce more so than others. They have that natural ability, their scores, whatever it is. They have a little bit of longer leash. But if they're not buying into defense, um, they won't be able to play. They, they, they just won't move on. You know, and, and we've had some players like that that are just, you know, have had massive junior A years and they don't get scholarships because there's a deficiency. Right. They just they just refuse to to compete defensively and, and they won't get taken. Is that what you'd say the biggest thing is when you're if you have a kid who's on your team and he's a pretty good player, for example, and he wants to have a, an NCAA D1 scholarship, but maybe he's not getting the interest. Like, do you think that's what a lot of NCAA teams are looking for and is the two, the two way 200 foot guys. Like that's why they might hesitate on some other guys because they might be, I wouldn't say like deficient, but they're lacking in one area or they need to develop in another area of their game. Well, for sure. I mean, I think, like I said, if you can't, or if you won't buy into doing it, I mean, they may take a chance on a real special offensively gifted guy, but he's not going to be able to play if he can't, if he won't play a 200 foot game. I'll give you a good example. You know, Jack Richard from last year, he came in as a, as a young kid, 16 year old. Um, and he was in and out of the lineup, but he was loyal to us. He stuck with us. The OHL wanted him. He's a six foot four centerman. Um, and, and we really forced him to be a defensive player. You're not here to score. And he was a scorer in, in, in midget. He put up numbers, but he, he bought in, he played, uh, he was in and out of lineup, didn't play a ton of minutes. His second year, a little bit more, his offensive ability came, you know, got better. 
Um, and his final year, Ayers, he, he was solid two-way player, um, scored 53 goals, was the leading, second leading scorer in our league. He's got a full ride to Niagara, right? So it's just, it's just that buying in, and that's what the parents have to understand. We There's not a coach in the world that doesn't want to put a guy on the ice if he's playing well and playing the right way. And as a coach, you want to be able to put four lines out like that. But, and that's where it comes down to like, you know, there, there's usually some deficiencies in an area when certain guys don't get to play as much as others. Oh, that's very, that's very true. And I think very informational for people listening is because there are a lot of people who believe, Hey, I'm putting up a lot of points. Like, why am I not getting these opportunities? And that's because hockey isn't how it might've been 20 years ago where they just care about scoring. Well, yeah. And, and, and to this day, I mean, you can ask Jack, I mean, if it's a two, one game, he's still not going on the ice. If you're up two one with a minute left, right? Because there's still those little tendencies as, as an offensive player, you're putting a guy that may have 10 points, but he's going to block a shot or he's going to do this. Um, and that's where parents and kids have to understand why I'm, why can I not go out in overtime? Well, because if you're a liability defensively, a coach isn't going to put you out there. You need to be a 200 foot guy. Yeah. You could take a risk and okay, just go score, but you've got to be able, to, he's going to put out mostly the, the 200 feet guys. This would be a probably a hard question to answer. I'm just curious. Like how is the, how is the league in the hockey from when you played to now? Like I I saw it just recently today or yesterday that the Niagara Canucks are joining your league. Yeah. Like, so that was always a team, for example, that was longtime junior B very, very well known junior B team. And they're coming into your league. Like when we were playing, when me and Josh were playing, there was like 60 teams and, and just like mm-hmm. four divisions or something. So it was very watered down. Now I think they've kind of leveled out more. There's less teams and teams are getting better, but what would you say? Yeah, it's, it, it was, it's definitely, I think the hockey is, um, the parodies. I don't, I, there's some teams. I talk, I'm just looking at our league now, Harrisy. Um, there's some teams that are in our league that probably are in it for the wrong reasons. And that's where they struggle getting players um, because they're, they're perennial. They don't do very well. And then they'll sell their better players come deadline. Um, and, and, and that hurts our league, but we have some really, really great programs where like a lot of kids want to go um, and that helps your league, but the, the league's improved. I think overall, um, yeah, it, it's better than it was. Um, I wouldn't say that the, like, obviously the talent that came out of our, like, I look at our team, like you and, and Carrie and Josh, and we had like, we were a pretty stacked team back then. Uh, or no, sorry, you weren't with that one, but Carrie, Josh, um, I mean, y- you played. Um, so, so the talent is coming out of the league. I would say there are the high end guys. Um, but overall, it's it's probably a little bit deeper now. That's definitely, uh, I think, my one regret. I wish I had stayed another year because that year, as you said, you guys were stacked and mm-hmm. you, we would have so, had a... So do I. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we would have had a long playoff run. That would have been fun. And obviously, Josh and Greg were setting league records, which is tremendous yeah. as well. I should have benched him. He broke my record. <laughs> Can't have that happen. Um, how long do you uh do you plan on coaching for? Is it like you said you have a huge passion for it? So are you gonna stay as as long as you can in the game, or eventually do you want to get some relaxing time, not always at the rink? Not a chance. They're gonna drag me out of there, Harzy. <laughs> gonna be buried under the ice. Exactly. Um, mm-hmm. Couple more for you here. Um, one thing I want to talk about, I th- I think it's like pretty pretty cool to see just kind of how every family is different. Like like you and your family, I'd say are super close, and you know, talk every day, whether it's your text on the phone, FaceTime, mm-hmm. or even if it's just for five minutes. Hey, what's going on? How's this? How's that? Like, j- just talk about the importance of that. Like how you've always ha- valued that closeness, and just kind of how you know you you guys have grown up as a family. Well. I mean, that's all you have in life, right? Is family and um, building those memories. And um, yeah, I think it's important just to communicate all the time. And like you say, we probably drive Josh nuts. 
Um, but it's the same thing. I mean, it's, I was the same with my dad. My, my, my parents were, followed my career, were over in Europe and came and visited RPI whenever they could. And um, yeah, it's all about, it, it is, it's all about family. It's just those experiences you want to share with the people closest to you. No, that's really what it is about. And it's, it's awesome to see that you guys are, are so close like that. And it's, it's honestly, every time you guys get together, and if it's for not seeing each other for a day, it would, you would see him, it was like a month, like, you know, you're just so happy to, to get together, do things together, talk, whatever it is. And, you know, that obviously makes the experience, as you said, when you went through a great and now for Josh, you know, having that support back home, and obviously you guys visiting is, is always a positive to have. When you look back at your career, so both, I would say, playing and, and coaching, like, did you think you would have had the career you had? Um, I was, you know what, I was blessed. I was so grateful. I, I made a living playing the game I love. Um, I mean, that was my goal. I never, I never, you know, when you're growing up doing it, you don't think of it as a career or a job or whatever. It's just, this is what I love to do. And I was lucky enough to be able to sustain myself and build a pretty comfortable living for myself, my family. And, um, but looking back as an old guy now, and I don't know if I would have, uh, I mean, I always believed in myself. There's no question, but I didn't know back then it was, it was kind of the NHL or, or bust, right. That was, but then when Europe came along and, and I didn't really realize it when I was playing that, Hey, Europe's an option, um, which I was very fortunate to find out. And, um, like again, again, play a pretty extended career over in Europe and, and do pretty well. And last one here. So if you were to give either one piece of advice or multiple pieces of advice, if you were talking to your younger self, so if you're talking to Mark Juris back when he's 16, 17, 18 years old, or even some of the young listeners listening, what would be some piece of advice you would give to them? Take your time. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Just be patient. You don't need it all in one day. If you believe in yourself um, and you're going to get there, they'll find you. Just be patient. It's better off playing than owning a title of I play here, but I don't really play. 100% agree. Um, everyone develops at a different speed. Everyone's Absolutely. path is different. So there's no uh, ideal path. Just because you're faster getting somewhere doesn't mean you're going to be better off in the long run. It's, you know, as you said, take your time, focus on building yourself up, being doing well at that level before jumping to the next. That's something, another thing some guys do is they jump 100%, too early. 100% here. So dom dominate the league you're in, then move on. 100% agree. Well, Mark, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, you know, I think you shared a lot with us. Loved the background through this whole thing. You know, some pictures of Josh uh, at Union College, which also was a rival of RPI. So that's kind of funny that your son went to the big rival. But uh, absolutely, yeah, I appreciate you sharing all your stories. Um, you know, it was really inspirational. Someone like yourself that had a tremendous career, and now you're definitely giving back to the the youth and advising them how to get to their goals, how to get to the next level. And yeah, I appreciate you taking the time and uh, I'll see you uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks here when I'm back in Canada. You bet. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. And for those listening, uh, until next time, juice and ciao.